Good morning, everyone. On behalf of the Arizona Small Business Association, welcome to Arizona Speaks. Are third-party payment transactions costing you more? My name is Katherine Atmar, VP and Chief Marketing Officer at CyberCatch. Thank you for joining us virtually today. ASBA has an amazing event planned out for us. I can't wait to delve into the new IRS reporting rule and hear what the tax experts have to say about the latest regulations. CyberCatch is a cybersecurity company helping businesses of all types and sizes stay safe from cyber threats. We are dedicated to making and keeping small businesses secure from cyber attacks, and we do this with an innovative software as a service platform that has been specifically designed for small businesses. As an ASBA member, you can save up to 20% on our highly effective security packages. At CyberCatch, we know how important it is to have all your bases covered as a business owner and employee, from tech to taxes. That being said, it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's event, Eric Knott. Eric is a past boardman for the Arizona business, Small Business Association and owner of human resource consulting firm Fine Point HR. Eric is a professor at ASU's WP Carey School of Business. He is also a member of the Executive Committee for the Society for Human Resource Management, SHRM, of Greater Phoenix, and for the Arizona SHRM State Council. To say Eric is an expert in business would be an understatement. Welcome, Eric. Right on. Thanks so much, Catherine. Um, and so we've got uh, everybody. We've got a, a busy, um, a busy program for you. Before we get started, though, I want to just take a minute and thank our sponsors. So um, first, a, a, a quick shout out to the Society for Human Resource Management of Greater Phoenix as um, one of our sponsors, Salt River Project. Um, so not only thank you for sponsoring this, but thank you for keeping the air conditioning on. Right, uh, CyberCatch, Journey Age. Mentor Cloud and Southwest Airlines. Um, so thank you to to those folks for um, certainly allowing us to uh, provide this uh, this education for you. So um, with that, I want to introduce our panel before we get started. We've got an excellent panel for you. So uh, first off, Lisa Novak is with the Internal Revenue Service. She's the Senior Stakeholder Liaison with the Communications and Liaison Outreach Division of the IRS. As a liaison, she works with pract practitioners, with small businesses and community-based organizations to provide information to ensure compliance with the tax laws. Um, she's been with the IRS since 1987. We were talking earlier about the changes that she has seen. Um, she started out as a tax auditor um, before getting into the edu education and the outreach side, right? The, the softer, gentler side. Um, and so Lisa, thank you for taking time out today. Um, so Mike Mahoney, who is an attorney and a shareholder with the fantastic Ogletree Deacons, he's a member of the firm's employee benefits and executive compensation practice, practice group, um, and he's also chair of the payroll tax and fringe benefits subgroup. He focuses on employment tax matters at both the federal and state levels and um, he focuses on strategic tax issues for employers with a global workforce. Mike, thank you for taking time out um, and, and spending time with us today. And then uh, Julie Maggie. Julie is um, the tax regulatory affairs lead with Cash App. Um, she's a liaison between the company and government tax officials and monitors state and federal tax legislation Julie was the state of Alabama's Commissioner of Revenue from 2011 to 2017. She's held leadership roles um, with, the, with national tax organizations like the Federation of Tax Administrators and the Multi-State Tax Commission. And she was one of the founding members of the IRS Security Summit. Um, good stuff. So Julie, thank you for taking time out uh, and, and spending with us today. Excited to hear what everybody has to say. Um, with that, let me toss it over to Lisa um, with the IRS and, and uh, she will take it away. Go for it, Lisa. Uh, she will take it away. Go for it, Lisa. Okay, thank you, Eric. Um, good morning, everyone. As Eric said, I'm with the IRS Communication and Liaison Division, and part of my job is to help people uh, understand what they need to do to be compliant with the tax laws. I'm going to spend the next few minutes over some of the basics about the new reporting threshold for the 1099-K. Next slide. 
All right, so the American Keep Play Act of 2021 is really what is governing this change. Um, they actually lowered the threshold for what we call third-party uh, third party payment network transactions. Uh, previously, the threshold was if you received at least $20,000 and had more than 200 transactions, you'd get a 1099K. As part of the American Keep Play Act, they lowered that threshold to touch those payments of $600, more than $600, regardless of the transactions. Now that's due to go into effect for calendar years after December 31st of 2021. However, in December 2022, the IRS delayed implementation of that law for one year. Um, so basically that, okay, well, we're not going to require those 1099Ks to be issued. However, um, that did not affect your reporting requirements. You're still required to report all income unless it's excluded by law. Um, and regardless of whether you receive 1099, 1099 miscellaneous, you're still required to do the, the reporting. But that actually came up as um, we received input from our partners, like our tax professional partners industry partners. The IRS wants to provide more time for those requirements are. Slide. Next slide. There we go. Okay, thank you. Um, so this is the example of the floor nine can look well, probably very for you. To, um, you can access some lines you want to at um, you can take a look at it, but you'll see um, the box there on the hand side is where the, uh, the issue will be contact and I'll talk about that. But over on the right hand side, there's box one where it's going to be the grant that you receive. That's what's reported. And you look a little bit further down from um, so yeah, unfortunately, we're having a, a hard time with your uh, with your signal, um, and and we're catching like every tenth word, unfortunately. Um, and so while they work on that uh, and see if there's anything that we can do on our end, um, let me let me just toss it over um, real quick, Mike. Um, so Mike Mahoney with Ogletree Deacons. Um, Mike, you know, so she was talking about the 1099K, um, right? And and you know, at, at some level, the the you know the new the new form, the new reporting requirements. What what is this? So what is this that employers, um, uh, 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 rather small businesses, need to um, need to file? Oh, and Mike's on mute. There we go. <laughs> Uh, Thanks for that, Eric. What, um, what would a webinar yeah. be without technical issues? So yeah, like welcome to 2023, everybody. Fantastic. So yeah, go for it. <laughs> so the, the the 1099K is really reporting third-party transaction payments. Um, I kind of liken this to payments that are made when there's almost, and, and certainly I welcome uh, Ms. Novak's uh, input, but it's really where there's a, a marketplace or intermediary that is, um, you know, creating a safe space, if you will, for uh, a seller of a good or a service to engage with the, the purchaser of that good or service. Um, so there's that, that kind of intermediary. So I, I liken that to what distinguishes it from a, uh, a non-employee compensation reporting obligation where there's a direct engagement with an independent contractor, whereas this is where uh, there's an intermediary that is largely responsible for creating um, the, the marketplace uh, and ensuring that both parties play by uh, a set standard of rules. 
So when you say there's an intermediary, are uh, like are we? Is that a like a a, um, a great toss over to Julie from Cash App? So is that what you're talking about with an intermediary, or um, you know, kind of putting this into in into different terms? Precisely. That that would be a great segue to Julie. <laughs> So with that, so Mike will be back, but but I can't pass that up. So Julie, um, you know, so walk me through. I've got a number of questions for you, but walk me through. So from from the Cash App perspective, how is this going to show up? Like, what are what are you seeing? How are you prepping your your customers, those small businesses, um, for this this transition? Sure, be be happy to talk about that. And, and I think to kind of lay some groundwork, we need to remind people that. This reporting obligation was was initially written into code in 2008 in the Housing and Economic Recovery Act, and it wasn't implemented though until 2012 was the first year that the 1099Ks went out. So it had almost a three four year implementation period. Um, this was modified during. 2021 in ARPA, and that's when the legislators in Washington, D.C. decided to change the threshold. So this is not something the IRS just chose to do on their own. This was written into the tax code, and this is what we are now um, faced with. In December, of, Lisa was talking about in December of 2023, the IRS issued a um, transition period of one year delay in implementation. So this should be going into the, into effect basically at the end of this year for next year, unless Congress acts. Um, there is a lot of legislation in Washington, D.C. right now, multiple bills, some bipartisan, some not, to modify the reporting threshold. So whether or not this is going to happen is anyone's guess. Um, but we do, we are watching that legislation and we do expect maybe some action in the fourth quarter of the year. But in the meantime, I think most industry uh, platforms like Venmo and PayPal and Cash App, we're operating on the assumption it will go into effect for uh, next year. And so programming, significant programming changes have been done because the platforms were created and um, operationalized based on the 20,250 uh, transactions that was created in 2008. So this is a much, much lower de minimis. Um, and so this is going to create millions more forms than what the IRS traditionally gets. Um, as a former tax administrator, would not be very eager to have to input all of those forms and take all of those small dollar amounts and reconcile them. But there is a way to do it. And I have great confidence in the IRS and being able to um, use these forms for um, what the purposes that they're intended for. Um, income is taxable. Uh, never not been uh, as part of our American tax code. And due to the changes in technology and changes in how people earn determine that there's a tax gap. And this is why the legislation was created. And so this is an effort to stop some of the leakage in tax dollars that it, that is not being paid today. And so some people estimate it up to um, $5 billion. So, I mean, no one knows what that dollar amount is, but it is a significant amount of money. And that is why this new change is going into effect. Uh, unless Congress acts. So yeah, what Julie, we have let me, is, sure, go ahead. Yeah, let me interrupt real quick. Let's see if, if Lisa's back um, so uh, and can finish um, her thought, right? Never irritate the IRS. So um, let's just make sure, let's see if um, if we can uh, allow her to finish. Lisa, can, are we good? Well, let me see. What do you think? Can you hear me? Are, am I coming through? Okay. Um, so can we get the PowerPoint back up on the 1019 case side? Perfect. Okay, so it's just uh, about that boxes 5A and 5L that you can barely see. But those are going to report the monthly gross amount. So depending on how you keep your records, which is a very important part, make sure you're reporting all of your income, um, that might come in handy for you. 
So I said you can go to irs.gov slash 1099k to find more information. Okay, next slide. So who's going to be um, impacted by this? Uh, you know, as mentioned in that there's going to be millions and millions more forms. Um, but who's actually going to be getting those forms? So it would be um, gig workers or people with, you know, kind of titles. If you do ride share, um, like Uber Lyft or delivery drivers, Uber Eats, um, Grubhub, those sorts of folks. Um, if you sell goods or services online uh, through online marketplaces, maybe like Etsy or eBay, um, or you just receive money through a payment app. Um, if you rent out part, uh, property through a third-party app, or maybe you just have had a side business, maybe you do crafts and you sell at a holiday craft fair and you collect the money through one of the payment apps. Um, so there will be a lot more folks receiving things in nine Ks um, this year. Um, next slide. One of the most common questions that we got when we were first going out doing outreach on this was, well, you know, I use a payment app just really with my friends and my family. You know, I'm just paying them back or they're paying me back, that kind of thing. So just to clarify that money received as a gift or reimbursement is not required to be reported on a 1099K. So there are some examples on some slides. So for example, if you're a college student and your grandmother gives you $650 to help pay for your books um, via one of the cash apps, uh, one of the payment apps, um, that would not require a 1099K. So there's other examples on the slide. I'm not going to go into them, but they're pretty self-explanatory, I think. So. Um, you know, there might be situations where you sell a personal item, but if you're selling it at a gain, that would be taxable. If you sell a personal item at a loss, that is not um, deductible on your return. So there are a lot of resources on rs.gov you can go to, um, and I will show you in just a minute. Uh, but if we can go to the next slide. So what happens when you receive a 99K form and there's um, system or there's errors on it? Um, the IRS does recommend that you can be sure of that form 1099K. And so that's why I pointed out about March 10th, their tech. You, you know what, Lisa? Unfortunately, again, yeah, unfortunately, again, we're, um, you're cutting in and out. Uh, I'm sorry. And I'm sure we'll, we'll come back to you here in, in a moment. So we'll give the folks uh, a chance to work on it. Um, and my understanding, the, the experience is better for the folks who, who are in Zoom um, that, you know, just kind of evidence that, that we've got the production team working on it. Our experience as we're doing this is actually super grainy and difficult. It's because they're trying to throw additional bandwidth at the folks in Zoom. So hopefully they're having a better, better experience with that. But bandwidth issues, right? Um, so... All right. Um, and so with that, I just something that that she mentioned real quick, Mike, that I wanted to um, touch on. So money received as a gift or reimbursement doesn't require a 1099K, um, of course. Right. I, you know, so I, I, I think we, we understand that. But how do you note that? So how would, um, you know, keeping in mind, you're not giving legal advice, right? So, uh, um, but how would, uh, how would you note that, um, that, hey, the, the money I'm getting from, from this particular, what appears to be a vendor or a person or, you know, whatever, no, that's a reimbursement. How, how would you do that? Oh, Mike's muted again. There we go. Thanks for the legal disclaimer there, Eric. Um, uh, as you, as you noted, right, the, the key is in having very accurate records of all of your transactions. And that way you can easily distinguish and discern between those that are, uh, I'll call them personal in nature versus those that are business related. Um, I'm also aware that some of the third party network providers they also have a, uh, I'll call it a toggle switch to oversimplify the technology, but a, a toggle switch that enables uh, payers to identify whether or not 
the payment relates to a business transaction or whether it's uh, you know reimbursing a friend for picking up uh, lunch or something like that. So, and so this would be, oh, uh, and so Julie, we're coming back to you here. So this, uh, so what you're talking about though, Mike, that's specifically through um, a third party transaction. Um, and so not with somebody who, um, who just, you know, kind of directly like Zell's uh, somebody else. Well, I guess Zell would be that third party provider, wouldn't it? Right. Yeah, exactly. So, Got it. Okay. All right. Sounds sounds good. So then, Julie and I interrupted your thought at one point because. Um, but what are what are these third party apps? So the Zells, right? The Zells of the world, Venmos, PayPal's, the lesser organizations, not Cash App, the awesomeness. Um, but what are what are these other organizations um, and uh, the customers of those organizations? What should they be expecting from those other organizations? Not necessarily just cash app but what type of of guidance or um software updates or, or notifications should folks be expecting um as kind of evidence that their cash app is uh their their third party app is um you know on the on the path to compliance here sure thank you i mean this has been a year of education um for uh, at least the past seven months or so um, not quite a year yet but um, at, at Cash App, we have two separate accounts. We have a personal account that you would use for reimbursing friends for the cost of a meal, for example. Um, and then we have a business account. Um, and the business account is the one that people would use to sell casual sales. Um, and so we have two separate accounts. So we don't have that toggle switch um, like other platforms have. So platform was established and based on um, their own proprietary rules and, and how they wanted to operate. So that, that is what we do at GAP. So we have been paying our users over the past seven months on, um, are you using your app for commingling sales? And please don't. Um, and we made it really easy to either switch from a personal account to a business account or to separate a separate account. Um, so that we have counseled them not to commingle types of sales or transactions within one platform to only use the business for business and the personal for personal transactions. And so that's been our um, marching orders for the past year. Um, and it's, it's worked out pretty well. Um, and there's a different um, cost to use a business cash app versus a personal cash app. So it's pretty self-evident to the user. Um, so we're, we're, you know, we're finding that the education process is, is um, going very smoothly. It's not, it's not a big dilemma for someone to understand the difference of why they need. Um, what, what we think that people will find is that the personal user will get a lot of 1099Ks next year that are not accurate. Um, they're not taxable mm. income. And that's what we're, we're concerned about um, as an industry. And just, you know, uh, you, it's scary to get tax forms in the mail that you don't know what to do with. Um, as a former tax administrator, I, I totally understand that. And, and what you want people to do is pay the fair amount of tax they owe, but not anything more. And I'm sure Lisa would agree with me on that as well. And, and what we're concerned about is reconciling incorrect 1099 case and that's going to be um, a burden on tax professionals next year as well as someone who does their own tax return themselves it's going to be quite concerning and, and the, the record keeping aspect of it is something that we've as a tax filing administration we've tried to get away from that um, where we have a lot of our records online and the records we get are completely accurate. Your employer remits information returns and those are I have record for years. The payroll industry does a great job. But this is a new way of looking at things and and our, our preference would have been if we have to do this, we, we should have had the three year sort of implementation period to kind of wash out the effective the incorrect uh, 1099 K so that once we all are issuing 1099 K's we're issuing accurate ones. 
So, and Julie, with that, um, and just briefly, so I get what, what Cash App's doing, and, it, and obviously you guys are on it, right? And, and thank you for kind of carrying that flag. What, for folks that have lesser uh, third-party transaction providers, right, some of the others, the Venmos, et cetera, what, what benchmark should they be looking for um, in terms of making sure that, that they are, their third-party provider is, um, is uh, prepared for something like this? Um, right and and is is you know kind of positioning the customer the the small business uh, for success here and it's not going to be something where we end up having to file amended returns or, or things along those lines because the the reporting from the third party provider was not what it needed to be. It's even even the most prepared platform is going to have a trouble is having trouble issue completely accurate to ninety nine Ks for the next year at least. Um, that's why that three year period would have been awesome because we would have been able to kind of get out of, of that of the reporting incorrect 1099 Ks. Okay. But you know, you can reconcile your 1099 K um, on your tax return, even if you have an incorrect one. Uh, the IRS is advising people to contact the issuer of the 1099 K and requesting a correct one. That doesn't always work in a, the same timely um, uh, amount that a uh, time that you want it to I mean you may be ready to file your tax return today and you have an incorrect 1099 K that's fine you can do that I just hope you have really good records because you're going to have to be able to explain the reconciliation of the 1099 K should ever you you receive an audit notice from the IRS throughout this process um, Bear in mind, there's going to be a lot of 1099 Ks issued over the next uh, 12, uh, three, I guess it goes into the end of February through the uh, end of March. So um, I don't know how much the IRS will be able to really get in and dive into these, but you know, you need to be prepared as a taxpayer to explain any sort of modification to a issued 1099 K that you may and um, I think the IRS is probably going to be pretty understanding over the next year or so because of this, you know, period of not being able to really get the, the time to have the inaccurate 1099Ks work, work their way through the system. Right on. Well, yeah, go for it, Lisa. Can you hear me now? Am I off mute? Yeah, okay. So one of the things I was trying to explain to the Oh, shoot. Uh, no, Lisa, yeah, we can't hear you. You know, and my, my next... Um, you know, my my next question, I you know, that I that I had kind of dovetailing off of what Julie was saying was, I mean, you can even just give us a thumbs up or a thumbs down. I just wanted to see, like, do you want to make national headlines right now? Break, you know, um, <laughs> breaking uh, breaking news here on the ASBA webinar and say that there's going to be some kind of soft enforcement for this for the first year <laughs> for employers. Is that um, is is that what's what's going to happen, or does it look more like no, we're we're pretty serious about this. You got to get on top of it, um, and there's there's not necessarily going to be a grace period. Yeah, I'm seeing thumbs down. Is it grainy <laughs> thumbs down, but thumbs down. All right. So we'll uh, we'll we'll pop back to you here in a second. We'll see if we can hear you. Um, but um, but with that, so Mike, on the um, on the compliance end, what do you worry about with this? So like, what's um, so you know if if it hasn't been clear throughout, um, Mike's practice is on the corporate defense side, so the tax defense side, um, and you know kind of helping businesses through uh, not only tax compliance but defending issues that they may have. Um, and so like what, as you hear this issue uh, or this change rolling out, Julie's done a, a nice job of saying, uh, we really would have loved a grace period here, or, you know, some, some three year transition uh, period. What, what is it that, you know, um, if folks were to get advice from uh, some, somebody who is in tax law, like uh, what, what keeps you up at night regarding this transition? Yeah, no, that, that's a great call out. And I was also probably hoping that Lisa was going to give us a bit of a thumbs up there uh, rather than the thumbs down, unfortunately, uh, because my my concern for uh, my clients would be, uh, and, and I think Julie was kind of alluding to some of this as well, um, information return penalties 
uh, in the event that we are sending incorrect information returns, namely a 1099-K to the IRS as well as the payees, um, you know, the, those penalties can become quite astronomical because they are on a per form basis. Um, what I would suggest, again, not providing legal advice, but whenever we're dealing with um, a penalty like the information return penalties, you want to be able to demonstrate that you acted responsibly both before and after the failure occurred. So you put in place all of those uh, fail safes, if that would be the word, or checks that Julie referenced um, to, sh to be able to show the IRS in the event that there are incorrect returns that are filed, you want to be able to show them that you did everything within your power um, to, to play by the rules, to comply with the 1099-K reporting requirement, uh, and potentially establish reasonable cause to have that penalty abated. Okay. All right. So the um, information return penalties are, I, I have not heard of that previously. So that it, it specifically relates to um, amended returns having to go back and in essence, uh, the, the penalty for requiring the IRS to redo something that, that presumably they've already done. Right. So an information return includes all the 1099s that we see. You, uh, businesses may have experienced it with W-2s. Um, or Affordable Care Act reporting, 1095 Cs. So all of those are kind of collectively referred to as uh, information returns. Um, again, it's a per form penalty. The penalty varies by year as well as um, the, the tier in which the, the penalty is assessed, which is based on whether the incorrect 1099K is corrected or not and when it's corrected. Um, but we, we have seen some fairly astronomical penalties for clients that, that really thought they had done everything they conceivably could have to, to be accurate in their reporting. Um, but the way, as, as uh, Julie mentioned, at the way this is being rolled out, uh, we're, all, we're all kind of putting the wheels on the bus as it is hurtling down the highway. Yeah. Okay. Good stuff. And, uh, and I didn't, um, Julie, did I see a finger there or no? No. Okay. <laughs> no, that's fine. And I, I think that, you know, I, I don't want to pre, you know, have this fear mongering about the 1099 K forms when people receive them in the mail next year. Um, just audit it. I mean, you can download your statements from your platform um, and the 1099 K and compare the two and, and audit and if you have some um, sales that are not that are business and need to be reported as income then you know account for those if you have some that are the opposite and are reimbursements or gifts account for that I mean there is a way to get through this but it does mean that you know we've kind of moved the the onus onto the tax payer versus the employer, for example, or the, or the platform until we get these inaccurate ones out of out of the system. Um, so I think we as a as a society, we relied on employers and payroll companies and 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 people like the, the IRS. And don't forget, this affects many states as well, um, Department of Revenue to give them forms that they can rely as being accurate and unfortunately we just don't really have that comfort level um, for the most part uh, we will we'll get there but for the, for the next you know, 12 months or so I don't I don't think we have a good way of saying that we're you know we're very comfortable that all the forms are issued are going to be hundred percent accurate because we we just know people um, are human and they they use the the forms, the platforms in ways that maybe they misunderstood. And so that's the, that's the dilemma we have for, for now until as a society, this new rule and what they have to do. Cool, cool.
Okay. Well, you know, with that, I wanted to make sure that we had time. We've got some, uh, it, <laughs> it's interesting. So I'm getting questions, not only from the chat. Thank you for those folks that are putting questions in the chat. People are texting me. I, um, so it cracks me up. Uh, we have attendees on that don't want to use the chat for whatever reason. But uh, so I've got a, a couple questions and you've, you've seen me kind of jotting a few things down. So the first one, um do uh so this question coming from well they're all, they're all from the audience but uh, from our chat um do i need an ein number for a business account um like what's the criteria what what makes it to where you know what triggers this requirement of disclosure the 1099 um k etc does it um it, is it only for those with an ein Oh, and so I don't, I apologize. Um, so Mike, I'm looking at you. I, I don't know why you can't tell that, but, uh, but yeah, so <laughs> that, that was my, my question, go for it, Mike. Yeah. So I, I would say from a, a legal perspective, there's no requirement that the person have an FEIN, right? We see people operating sole proprietorships where they don't uh, have a separate legal entity. Um, now I, I think Julie may tell us that programmatically the systems are, are sometimes set up to require FEIN. So I, I guess I would pitch that over to Julie on how Cash App is uh, set up. Yeah, and, and I wish Lisa could talk to us too as well. Um, we, we allow the account to be, the business account to be set up using the social security number um, and then the identification number your security number. Um, so that's that's our process. I, I can't speak for the rest of the sounds like, so it sounds like either way, either an EIN or a social security number, yeah, you were also cutting out, Julie. So whatever it is, it seems to be contagious. But um but yeah, so no worries, no worries. But Lisa, do you want to pop in with that? Is there anything else um on the you know the whether or not an EIN is is needed, a federal EIN? I will try. Um, so you're not required to have an EIN except in certain circumstances if you have employees or there's certain other requirements. However, if you want a business bank account, you're going to be required to have an employer identification number as well. So if you can use that to differentiate between your social and your EIN on these accounts, that would be great. Right on. Okay. And so, uh, no, I, uh, yeah, we did. Yeah. Um, thank you. And so just real quick, does this rule affect nonprofits? I'm, I'm getting a couple, uh, you know, kind of a, a theme to some of the questions um, on, hey, is this relevant for nonprofits or, you know, can I disconnect, et cetera. So, um, so yeah, do, do we want to save our nonprofit folks 21 minutes um, or does this in fact apply to them as well? You know, that's a good question, and I don't have an answer to that. Okay. What, what, um, do, do we have like a spidey sense? So like Mike, you know, any, any thoughts on it? Do we anticipate uh, based on, on the past of, of how these, of these rules have been implemented that they would, um, that it would apply to nonprofits? Um, I, I would say that the reporting may apply. Whether or not there is a tax reporting obligation would be a very separate issue for the nonprofit to determine if, if it's the, for example, recipient of a 1099-K. Um, ultimately, this is going to be a facts and circumstances assessment of whether, they're, whether the uh, third-party organization needs to issue the 1099-K and what the recipient nonprofit entity needs to do with it. Um, okay. I, I would say generally speaking though, I, I don't think we unfortunately can give 20 minutes back to our nonprofit friends. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, yeah, I agree with you there. So, so me taking, uh, so me being an HR guy, right. Having absolutely no tax, uh, tax guidance here. I feel like I know the answer to this next one, but, um, but let's, uh, let's see. So the question is, um, it seems very innocent, right? Uh, so I'll be safe if I'm just house sitting 
for friends and family, and they pay me through Zelle or Cash App. I shouldn't receive a 1099, and I'm not obligated to disclose that, assuming it's more than $600. Um, that you know, so I'm safe if I'm just house setting for uh, for friends or family, right? And my my thought with that is, uh, I don't think so. I mean, you're getting paid for a service that you rendered. I um, the fact that it's friends and family, they were, um, you know, uh, yeah, it's irrelevant. Uh, you know, that said, that's that's uh, unsophisticated tax advice from Eric. Lisa, am I right or or no? You are correct. If you receive a payment for a service, it's going to be taxable, and you should be reporting that income. Longley receives a 1099 form. What if they get it and their their thought is, so back to we talk about, you know, errors, errors in reporting, et cetera. What if they get a 1099 um, and, and their, uh, their thought is, hey, this was issued to me an error by this, um, you know, this, this other entity. Uh, and, and so Mike, do you wanna take that? And then Julie, given that it might have come, uh, that it might have been processed through an organization similar to yours, I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts as well. But Mike, do you wanna start with that of if you wrongly receive a 1099? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, to uh, give kind of the first level answer. And it's, it's go back to the uh, issuer of the form and, and talk to them and indicate why you don't believe uh, you appropriately received it, right? So that explanation may be, I was reimbursed for lunch that I had with friends, right? Um, whatever the reason is as to why you think that payment, for example, may have been personal rather than business or for services, um, that would be the explanation you want to provide to the issuer. Um, and and my expectation is that the issuers and, and uh, you know, certainly we can we can get Julie's uh, insight on this, but I would expect that there's a means of submitting those types of uh, reporting requests or, or uh, issues uh, that would enable some type of process to kick off to determine whether or not the 1099K needs to be corrected. Yes, and Julie, you're absolutely right. Yeah, there, there is a process in place, but as I referenced earlier, the timing doesn't always work out for people um, the way they, they want. And so um, there is a, a very good tutorial on the irs.gov website under the 1099K search uh, keyword that shows you multiple examples of how to reconcile um, what number the box that you fill out. And um, that's why I think that auditing the 1099K when you get it and being able to document where the values are incorrect, filling out your 1040 much easier next spring when you're ready to file your taxes. So, um, you know, that I think that's also an option for taxpayers who, uh, you know, want to take care of their tax filing obligation um, at the time that, you know, as early as possible. Because uh, it takes a while to issue corrected uh, to 99Ks. So, and then Lisa, I wanted to toss this next one over to you. So, um, someone asked if I'm paying a non employee through Cash App, do I provide them a 1099 NEC or is the 1099K the only requirement? Um, So that's a good question, but I believe the 1099 NEC is required. Did you hear me? I, yeah, no, we got it. We got it. Sounds good. And Mike, any thoughts? Don't disagree with the IRS, but go go for it. <laughs> I, I agree. It's it's um it's a unique situation there. If it's truly for kind of non-employee compensation. Um, then, then the 1099 NEC seems to be the, the, the first point of payment. If it's going through Cash App, um, I think that's one thing we'd need to think about, whether there would also potentially be a separate 1099K. Um, and then we've kind of got double reporting of income and, and how to sort all of that out. Um, but first, the reason we would want it on an NEC um, would be really to to just reflect the independent status of that that person. 
Well, so and um, two two questions that um, one of them I'm a little bit surprised with, but um, so the the first question. So how does this IRS rule apply to me if I'm just sending friends and family money? And my again, me taking the amateur approach here. My thought is it it depends on what you're sending friends and family money for. Or what triggered that? And if it's for payment for services, you, you know. Etc. Then, yeah, it does apply to you. Um, but what about somebody? Maybe we've got two folks that cohabitate in a house, and one person always sends the other uh, money for like bills or reimburses for you know uh, the the APS bill or SRP bill, right? And um, and you know the mortgage. Does does that trigger um, this type of of reporting requirement? A ten ninety nine k. Lisa, thoughts. It, it, it would not be reportable, um, so you should not receive a 1099-K for those instances, but if you do, then you'll want to follow the procedures that are on IRS.gov that show you can't get that corrected copy and go ahead and include the, the gross amount in your gross income and take it off as another adjustment. Right on. Okay. And, it, you know, one that that's come up, I'm, I'm seeing it twice now. Um, and it just worries me a little bit. Um, and so uh, the the question um, is, paraphrasing from, from this is, so as a as a gig worker, do I have to report or track my income, even if I'm not provided a 1099 uh, miscellaneous or a 1099 K from you know, whatever, whatever the delivery app is, et cetera. I think, you know, so I feel like um, if that is still a question, uh, even I like, yes, you have to report your income, but that's so Mike, I mean, is there, is there like, uh, if you were to summarize it, the reader's digest version, right? A paragraph of like, yes, here's what you have to report. And, and at some level, I feel like this is the IRS's effort to specifically um, address that, gaping hole in in reporting which is the the folks who are doing gig work who are just kind of doing it under the table but you know mike any advice for these folks in terms of so wait a second if i'm delivering for some you know food delivery app now all of that yep. is taxable and you know what what level is that taxed at is that taxed at like as an independent contractor where i'm going to pay both the employer and the employee portion or like how much of this so can you just like give us a an overview of that and then uh, yeah. everybody else to chime in yeah yeah happy to kind of give a quick overview so uh any accession to wealth is considered income right so so really anything um unless it is specifically in, uh, excluded um, so, so anytime you receive anything, regardless of whether you get a 1099, a W-2, um, wh whether it's a 1099 NEC, MISC, 1099K, um, if it, it's really, if it's an exception to wealth and unless there's an exclusion that applies, you do have an obligation to report it. So that's even if it's under $600. Um, you should still be reporting that on your personal income tax return. Um, the type of taxation that will apply will be income taxation. Um, if you're performing services through kind of your, your business, um, you would be paying self-employment taxes as well. So that's kind of our, uh, you think about FICA taxation, uh, Social Security and Medicare. It's, it's largely the same, except you pay both the employee share and the employer share as that kind of business operator and owner. Um, there, there really aren't many exclusions that that would apply. Uh, and so I often hear from people, um, hey, I just, I, I bought a car and I sold a car and I made a profit. Do I have to report that? I didn't get a 1099. The answer is yes, right? If you had an accession to wealth, if you are better off because of that deal that you struck, um, you have to pay taxes, right? That's the, the social contract that we've all kind of agreed to. Um, again, they're really, the, the reporting is more of a means of facilitating someone's reporting of the income and raising awareness on the side of the IRS, but it should not be the sole uh, 
determining factor for people on whether or not to report income on their tax return. Right on. Right on. Very good. Lisa, anything you want to add before I uh, ask Julie for her thoughts on it? So the, this being the, uh, the gig worker who's like, wait, wait, does this apply to me? Yeah, actually, I think summed it up pretty well. Um, I do want to say that there is a link on the last slide that you'll get in the handout to the Gig Economy Tax Center. So if you are in the Gig Economy and you don't know how enough taxes are going to apply to you, I would suggest to take a look at that link. Right on. Very good. And then, uh, so Julie, anything uh, on that? To, uh, so again, and Mike, thank you uh, for the, uh, I don't know, the excellent response. But Julie, any any thoughts on that? Wait, yeah, the, the gig worker of the, you know, wait, wait, does this, does this apply to me? So. Yeah, I, I think Mike did a great job answering that question. But it, we had this debate internally at work um, last year. And, you know, a, as a society, um, if we think that how someone earns their living should be taxed at a different rate, then we need to go back and visit the tax code and, and change our tax laws. Um, but as the tax laws are written today, um, you know, we, we have income tax in, in a certain way and it doesn't matter how you receive your paycheck in what way, shape or form, um, and whether or not you receive documentation in the mail or, or from your employer, you know, we're all held to the same level uh, of tax, not only at federally, federally, but also state. So, um, you know, it, it drives a, you know, kind of a, um, a, you know, a bigger question in that now that our society has evolved to this technology platform and, and people are more self-employed than they probably um, should they should everyone be taxed the same regarding income? So I mean, it's a really interesting time uh, to be you know in the tax business. If um, if I if I can have the luxury of saying that, I think Lisa might also enjoy it, and and Mike as well. But for you know the people who will be receiving these 1099 Ks, they're they're the ones I'm I'm most concerned about, and and what I, I'd like to not instill any sort of um, you know, hysteria in what's going to happen next spring. Um, this will be just a little bit of a confusing time, but we will get through it and we will have the ability to reconcile the forms um, when we file our taxes. So it's, it's not something that's going to prevent you from, and hopefully if you qualify for a refund, receiving your refund in a timely manner. So, you know, I, I hope that there's some calmness next tax season uh, regarding this issue that um, that taxpayers will will adopt. Well, and and real quick, just one um, one uh, quick question that has come up as I'm monitoring the chat as well. So, uh, Mike, this may be more for you. So what's the difference between a 1099 uh, NEC and a 1099 K? But what's the substantive difference there? Yeah, so the 1099-K really uh, deals with the situation that involves that third-party payment processor. Um, so whether it's Cash App, Zelle, Venmo, um, it's Stripe, there, there's a number of them out there. Um, whereas the NEC would more traditionally apply just in a, a direct engagement, right? If, if Ogletree Deacons engaged a, an independent contractor for um, perhaps janitorial services, mm -hmm. we would issue a 1099 NEC directly to that janitor. Whereas um, if a person delivers food through an on-demand platform and that platform uses um, you know, a third party payment processor, it would be the third party payment processor that would issue the 1099K, not necessarily the uh, software developer that, uh, you know, created the marketplace for that person to deliver the food. Well, all this talk about food, and it's almost 11 o'clock, so, you know, it's it's about time for us to, you know, kind of wrap up. Any, like, a, a quick 20-second wrap-up? And, Lisa, I wanted to start with you. Any any last words, just a quick 20-second wrap-up from you? 
you know, one thing we haven't mentioned is the 1099-Ks also apply to credit card transactions. So your bank who is ever processing your credit card transactions, there, there's no threshold on that. If you do a dollar on credit cards, you will get a 1099-K from the bank. So I just wanted to clarify that. Right on. Right on. And Mike, any any last last words? Uh, about twenty seconds um, to wrap up. Uh, you know, as as new reporting requirements roll out, obviously it can be um, daunting at times, but it's also a, a great opportunity to seek counsel and, and advice uh, to the extent you're receiving something that you don't understand or that you don't believe uh, is accurate. Nice, very very cool, Julie. Any last thoughts? Yeah, I would watch the news between uh, now and the end of the year to see what Congress does about either lowering the threshold from 20,000 to 10 or 5,000 or re re uh, repealing it back to the original $20,000 uh, level. Um, there's a lot of talk uh, in Washington about this. And so um, while I would work on the assumption that nothing's going to change and we will have the $600 threshold, I would keep my eyes on the news to see if that does actually happen in Washington. Right on. Well, Lisa Novak with the IRS, Mike Mahoney with Ogletree Deacons, and Julie Maggie with uh, with Cash App. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I do want to uh, uh, toss this real quick over to Karen Walker, who is the Community Engagement Manager with Mentor Cloud, um, and give her a few minutes here. Karen, take it away. and I am the manager of community engagement here at Mentor Cloud, and it is my honor to be closing out this session of AZ Speaks. At Mentor Cloud, we are dedicated to helping businesses create an enriching experience and foster personal development and provide mentoring and learning opportunities. Today's AZ Speaks event has been a powerful reminder of the value of continuous learning through connection and wisdom sharing. And I learned so much today, and I want to thank our panelists and ASBA for hosting this event. We, preach, we appreciate all of you for tuning in, and ASBA will be sending out a follow-up, as well as um, that deck that Lisa was not able to share, but I want to learn so much from that deck. So on behalf of all of us here at MentorCloud, the panelists, and ASBA, thank you so much for tuning in. Tuning in. <laughs>